The Symphony of Canterlot, Chapter 17, To the Maw of the Beast Six minutes later. Luckily, Sea Sandstone Cove was still around the castle. I followed her ether trail from when we first met. At the moment, she was talking to some tall, blonde-maned, white pretty boy with a white smoking jacket and large chest frame in the lobby leading to the exit. He had the most forced accents I've ever heard, and his horn was half the size of a bloody damn foreleg. The only thing actually respectable about him is his brass compass flower mark, which was meant to represent his diplomatic ability. Of course, I'm talking about Count Blueblood. What, what? You expect me to call him Prince? Really? Sorry. But let's make one thing clear here. Blue Blood legally changed his name to Prince Blue Blood and declared himself to be a descendant of Prince Ironclad, Celestia's first son who died over 800 years ago at that point, I might add, and he did this with a false convoluted genealogy as a publicity stunt to try and get the more conservative unicorn nobles that actually held seat in Parliament to try to agree on a trade deal with the Scorpion Empire, across the Atlantic and past the Mediterranean Sea. Celestia might have liked the intention, but she despised her son's name to be used in such a way, so she condemned him to be her eyes and ears in every aristocratic gathering he could enter. When I got next to them to try and talk to Miss Cove, I heard the following. Listen to me, you stupid mud pony. I need to get to my tea at exactly 7 sharp in the morning, or else I won't be able to stay awake and listen to the dribble of both the arrogant parliament nobles and moronic commoner officials. And would it have killed you to wear the short Gallic outfit? I need those- At that moment, I turned him to me in the blink of an eye and slugged his muzzle with a resounding crunch and the sickeningly wet feeling of blood. Naturally, he dropped to the ground covering his bleeding muzzle with both hooves. My beautiful sexy face! You made me bleed my beautiful sexy blood! After I heard that, I began to ignore his whining and pain groans, mostly because I really didn't care much for him. Miss Cove. Uh, sorry about that, um, but I need a favor. I need you to take this letter to the barracks to a corporal percutor with a bouquet of white lilies and lavenders that you will buy in the address I wrote on the back. Don't worry about the bits. This banknote is in the envelope with the letter. She paid attention, but she was still trying to properly process the fact that I openly punch other ponies with little provocation. Um, sh sure. Eh, it was close enough. All right, I'll see you around. Around 9 a.m., the Narrows. I was restless. My mind played with the possibilities. About a dozen different scenarios were working their way through my mind. I needed to bring the evidence back to Celestia, and I needed to get my hooves on a living Thule. The last one had proven to be difficult. The first one should have been easy, granted that everything was still in order. Though I wasn't sure. I knew that I needed to check the Canterlot Underground, the sewers and surface tunnels that traverse the whole city. Henry's gang, they knew how to use it well. And if there was a place more ideal in the whole Unicorn Range, the Everfree, and the Canterlot Mountains to hide secrets and move freely, I didn't know it yet. Mary stayed silent, her demeanor more and more somber. I tried my best to stay focused on the task as we trotted from the Palace District to the Canterlot Narrows. It was the part of Canterlot that none of the tourists or foreign dignitaries got to see. It was old, made of ancient centuries-old stone masonry, and by all standards, derelict. The earthen, griffins, zing, and even some unicorns that lived in this area were living in what, well, can be only described as resentful squalor. Most of them were either dying of sickness due to the nasty sanitary conditions, or because they got beaten to death in the process of stealing a wallet. That place could only be called misery. The red light at least was clean, and by all standards was filled with pleasure houses of all types. The Narrows, though. The Narrows. Oh, that was the last place you ended up before dying in Canterlot. The Narrows was the price of opulence, in a way. I was no stranger to slums, especially considering that I came from Shoal's Kitchen, but back in Manhattan, we at least didn't pretend that Shoal's Kitchen didn't exist. 
I pyrokinetically lit my cigarette as we started getting closer to the corpse alley. It was the only way to get on the route to Henry's place in the sewers, mostly just to overpower the smell and to tell any would-be desperate muggers ready to pounce on us. Fuck off. After saying that, I heard hooves stop in their tracks and start trotting in the other direction, until we reached it. Corpse Alley. Mary talked first. What she saw certainly earned her attention and mine. It is just not my bloody fucking day. In the harshest tone that the pretty mare could muster. I on the other hoof? In the alley filled with corpses lie the army of the hopeless, but... It seems that we're late. What is it that we saw? Chum. Or at least it looked like that at first glance. In reality, it was the blown-up remains of half a dozen ponies, their blood still wet and painting the soot-covered greystone walls of the alley. Some of their limbs still intact, enough to be recognizable, and wet flesh and shattered bone everywhere on sight, along with, I can only guess to be, uh, shredded internal organs. This, of course, was covering, or was in, with the somewhat shredded remains of their clothing consisting of green military-style fatigues, with black leather trench coats. Some brass goggles and gas masks were also around. Oh. That, that was a fucking disaster. There was too much raw savagery back there to be the work of an equine, and the wound patterns spoke of something that moved in a way that I have never seen before. The corpses reduced to a chum, and speak of a sudden lightning strike to the horn. <sighs> Nasty way to go, but from what I can tell it was probably quick at the very least. Not enough time to think about your imminent demise, small mercy if there ever was one. Then I saw it. Covered in blood in the middle of it all, a steel object somewhat looking like a gun, but not quite it. It was large. And it was cumbersome. About twice the mass of the old Enfield service rifle that I used during my time in the Legion. I telekinetically lifted it off the pool of blood and flesh and looked at it carefully. And then I took it with my right forehoof, and the sound it made when it activated was like hearing an electrical generator up close. It had a powerful hum that ran through both of our bodies, probably from the electrical engines that it emanated from its core. Did it have to do with the surrounding carnage? Probably, maybe one of them tried to turn it on in a desperation attempt because of what they might have encountered, and due to poor hoof dilling, it caused a misfire or a power surge of some kind. Though. To be fair, at the very least I had a good piece of evidence to study if it proved to be too impractical to use, that is. I say, we move forward. Don't you agree? Mary already had my 44 revolver loaded and ready when I asked. She certainly was a good girl. Agree. Doesn't even describe it, love. Care to give this girl a fag? And I did so. I gave her one of my Jade Dragon cigarettes and pyrokinetically lit it for her. She took in a deep drag, and she then blew the smoke out between her teeth. I'm good now. We trotted until reaching a seemingly empty wall on the back. We waited only for a couple of seconds, as customary. With the heavy sound of derelict gears grinding, the wall began to sink into the cobblestone alley, revealing a passageway into the stairs leading into the sewers. Somehow, the stench emanating from it overpowered the stench of death in the alley of corpses. Well, once more into the unknown, we both went in, and with that, it began. First blood. The oldest and strongest emotion of equine kind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown.